All right, we are in the 66th chapter of the book of Isaiah. And since that is the last chapter, this will hopefully be the last class in Isaiah. Uh, it's been a very long road, and I realize that um, we've had some you know, cycling in and out because of the teaching situation, and uh, sometimes it's a little awkward whenever you're getting through a biblical book, and you're here one part, and you're gone in the next part. I'm going to try to line us up with the quarter system in the near future in this class. After covering Isaiah, what I hope to do is I hope to start a study in the book of Ephesians, and that should hopefully take us to the end of the month of June. Uh, this is a little outline I found and I thought would be helpful for kind of organizing everything again. There's a certain symmetry to the ending part of Isaiah. Uh, you've got two sections that talk about this new heavens and this new earth concept, uh, really kind of a new creation. And then there's two sections from 66, 1 through 6 and 66, 5 through 7, 15 through 17 where God rebukes the people for their false worship. He rebukes them for the fact that even though they've come and they performed all these rituals, they do not love Him and honor Him with a pure heart. And they do not serve Him honestly. It's really kind of parallel to some of the issues we saw in chapter 1, where God said, you spread out your hands in prayer, but your hands are covered with blood. So I'm not going to listen to your prayer. And in the middle of all this, of course, at the very center of this new creation that God plans to build is the Jerusalem, the mother of the people. Jerusalem is personified as this mother. Uh, and we'll talk about that when we get to it. Uh, we already looked a little bit at chapter 66. But we've already covered the first part up there. Uh, so I want to pick up again in chapter 66. Thus says the Lord, Heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. Where then is a house you could build for me? And where is a place that I may rest? For my hand made all these things. Thus all these things came into being, declares the Lord. But to this one I will look, to him who is humble and contrite of spirit, and who trembles at my word. But he who kills an ox is like he, one who slays a man. He who sacrifices a lamb is like the one who breaks a dog's neck. He who offers a grain offering is like the one who offers swine's blood. He who burns incense is like the one who blesses an idol. As they have chosen their own ways and their soul delights in their abominations, so I will choose their punishments and will bring on them what they dread. Because I called, but no one answered. I spoke, but they did not listen. And they did evil in my sight and chose that in which I did not delight. Hear the word of the Lord, you who tremble at His word. Your brothers who hate you, who exclude you for my name's sake, have said, Let the Lord be glorified that we may see your joy. But they will be put to shame. A voice of uproar from the city, a voice from the temple, the voice of the Lord who is rendering recompense to his enemies. Before she travailed, she brought forth. Before her pain came, she gave birth to a boy. Who has heard such a thing? Who has seen such things? Can a land be born in one day? Can a nation be brought forth all at once? As soon as Sion travailed, she also brought forth her sons. Shall I bring to the point of birth and not give delivery, says the Lord? Or shall I, who gives delivery, shut the womb, says your God? Be joyful with Jerusalem and rejoice for her, all you who love her. Be exceedingly glad with her, all you who mourn over her, that you may nurse and be satisfied with her comforting breasts, that you may suck and be delighted with her bountiful bosom. For thus says the Lord, Behold, I extend peace to her like a river, and the glory of the nations like an overflowing stream. And you will be nursed, you will be carried on the hip, and bundled on the knees, as one who whom his mother comforts, so I will comfort you. And you will be comforted in Jerusalem. Then you will see this and your heart will be glad, and your bones will flourish like the new grass, and the hand of the Lord will be made known to his servants. But he will be indignant toward his enemies. For behold, the Lord will come in fire, and his chariots like the whirlwind, to render his anger with fury, and his rebuke with flames of fire. For the Lord will execute judgment by fire, and by his sword on all flesh. And those slain by the Lord will be many. Those who sanctify and purify themselves to go to the gardens, following one in the center, who eat swine's flesh, detestable things, and mice, will come to an end altogether, declares the Lord. For I know their works and their thoughts. The time is coming to gather all nations and tongues, and they shall come and see my glory. I will set a sign among them, and will send survivors from them to the nations. Tarshish, Put, Lud, Meshek, Rosh, Tubal, and Javan, to the distant coastlands that have neither heard my fame nor seen my glory. 
and they will declare my glory among the nations. Then they will bring all your brethren from all the nations as a grain offering to the Lord, on horses, in chariots, in litters, on mules, and on camels, to my holy mountain Jerusalem, says the Lord, just as the sons of Israel bring their grain offering in a clean vessel to the house of the Lord. I will also take some of them for priests and for Levites, says the Lord. For just as the new heavens and the new earth which I make will endure before me, declares the Lord, so your offspring and your name will endure, and it will be from new moon to new moon, and from Sabbath to Sabbath, all mankind will come to bow down before me, says the Lord. Then they will go forth and look on the corpses of the men who have transgressed against me, for their worm will not die, and their fire will not be quenched, and they will be an abhorrence to all mankind. Alright, so just looking at a couple things here. Uh, we, we talked briefly about the meaning of the first couple of verses. Heaven is my throne, earth is my footstool, where is the house you would make for me? Does anybody know where that's quoted in the New Testament? Just kind of an offhand question. Well, uh, well no, I mean that, that, that segment is in Revelation, the idea of a new heavens and a new earth. I was talking about verses 1 and 2. Heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. Where then is a house you could build for me? Yes, Jenna. Acts chapter 7. Tell us about that. Stephen said it, okay. Yeah. It's kind of one of the key texts in Stephen's sermon in Acts chapter 7. Essentially, yes. I mean, Stephen's sermon in Acts 7 is basically, you know, he tells the history of Israel from a perspective of you guys have basically been rejecting every leader that God has sent you since day one. You haven't served God once. You, that, that tabernacle that you had in the wilderness was really the tabernacle of idols. And he says, even this temple that you built, what is it? He says, it's not God's house, ultimately. The Most High does not dwell in houses made by human hands. Acts 7.48, The Most High does not dwell in houses made by human hands, as the prophet says, Heaven is my throne, and earth is the footstool of my feet. What kind of house will you build for me, says the Lord? Or what place is there for my repose? Was it not my hand which made all these things? You men who are stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you are always resisting the Holy Spirit. You are doing just as your fathers did. Which one of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? They killed those who previously announced the coming of the Righteous One, whose betrayers and murderers you have now become. You who received the laws ordained by angels and yet did not keep it. Did I see a hand? Uh, oh, okay, well, and so the idea here, Stephen reminds the rulers, God does not dwell in handmade temples. This temple that you think is so great right now, he says, ultimately, you know, it's no different from your fathers. It's, they've made an idol of the temple, like in the days of Jeremiah, believing that the temple of the Lord would protect them from the consequences of their own wrongdoings, of the consequences of murdering the prophets. And there's an implicit condemnation in this sermon. Uh, in Acts 7, there's, Stephen's kind of making an implicit point that, you know, because you killed Jesus, that's ultimately going to result in the destruction of the temple. And, you know, that happens in AD 70. And the Bible doesn't specifically record what happened in AD 70 regarding the destruction of the temple. But Jesus talks about it in part in Matthew 24 and in Mark 14 and in uh, Luke chapter 21. Uh, so there is, there is an, uh, that idea is ultimately in the minds of the New Testament writers that, you know, what we, that current system of sacrifice is going to be done away with and obliterated. Because ultimately it's too small for God, is it not? And Isaiah 66 is making that point. Any temple that man builds is ultimately going to be inadequate. Any worship that man offers ultimately is not going to be adequate for God. It is God who makes adequate things adequate and accepts things. You know, but you think about that. We personally are not capable of giving God the worship He deserves. We can give what He instructs. We can give what He commands. But what He deserves is a whole other thing. Um, we, we get a little further down. Was there a comment? Yes, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. You know, 
you know, you saying that kind of reminds me of Isaiah 6. Uh, whenever all the way back in Isaiah 6, you know, Isaiah has this vision. He's in the temple. And, you know, is God restricted to the temple? Well, no, it's not. Because while he's seeing this vision in the temple, the seraphim are saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. You know, that temple can't contain him. God's too big for that. The earth is the Lord's and all it contains. The earth is full of the glory of the Lord. And it says something, you know, when Jesus is talking about this new age coming, when neither in this mountain nor in this temple will they worship through the Lord, but what? They will worship in spirit and truth. You know, there's going to be a little bit of a change in what's going on in the sense that, you know, we're no longer restricted to a geographical location. We no longer have to make a pilgrimage to Jerusalem three times a year to offer sacrifices because the Lord's presence is in all places. God dwells within His people through His Spirit uh, even now. So there's that element as well. Um, okay, good. Any, anything else? So, I want to look at verses 3 and 4. And he describes all these great things that happens, and then he kind of looks at the temple worship for a second and says, but the one who kills an ox is like one who kills a man. What? If you sacrifice a lamb, you're like somebody who breaks a dog's neck. If you offer a grain offering, that's like offering pig's blood. Why are, the, why are the sacrificial rituals being equated with uncleanness and defilement and murder? Why does he equate them that way? Okay, they're hypocrites. Yeah, Mark? Ah. Just as they have chosen their own ways and their own delight in their abomination. Malachi speaks about the same thing. Mm -hmm. and, and God finally in Malachi says, I would that someone would just close the doors of the temple altogether so you can't even get in there. Yes. Yeah, that's true. Well, there's a lot of this kind of talk in the prophets. Uh, you know, Malachi 1 and verse 10 is one example of that where Malachi says, you know what, your worship is worthless. Just shut the doors because you're, you're wasting this time. Same here. Uh, Isaiah 1. Uh, oh, this, Isaiah is kind of neat how it bookends itself. There's a lot of stuff in Isaiah 66 that we saw in Isaiah 1. And, you know, there's some theories out there that Isaiah was really written in segments and pieced together after the fact. But these bookends, to me, testify to a unified book. Uh, but, in, you know, you read Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 10. Well, in verse 11, God says, What are your multiplied sacrifices to me? I've had enough of the burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed cattle. I take no pleasure in the, bull of bull, in the blood of bulls, lambs, or goats. When you come to appear before me, who requires of you this trampling of my courts? In other words, why are you coming in and wearing out my carpet, God might, you, we might say. You know, you're just coming in. You don't mean any of it. Your sacrifice is worthless. And he even goes on to say he hates their sacrifices. He hates their festivals. That's pretty strong language, considering God's the one that commanded all that stuff. But what's going on here is, you know, God did not literally hate the sacrifices. He commanded them in the law. But the hyperbole points out the fact that their false worship inspires God's hatred. God's saying, you know, it would be better if you just didn't show up at all than if you came and, you know, pretended and lived this lie that you've created for yourself. The point he's offering in Isaiah 66 is that unclean hearts always offer unclean sacrifices. Oh, okay, all right. Yeah. Unclean hearts always... Mm -hmm. People that say that together later because of similarities in the beginning and the ending and things like that. The way you teach anything, introduce it, you tell them what you're going to tell them. <laughs> then you tell them, and then you summarize it at the end or tell them what you told them. Somebody that would take that, that organization of this book and say, oh, it's all pieced together because of something like that. Well... No, well, I, I think probably I should. This is what happens when I. Where it started. This is what, no, that's not the point. It would start on. I think that's evidence against that. Uh, the the way that theory started was I'm more. I'm saying that, it, this, that is evidence. Against that theory. It is. Yes, I agree. That's like I said, that was a side point. Yeah. No, I don't. I don't want to. I don't want to get sidetracked on Deutero. I got through the whole class without getting sidetracked on Deutero. I, I, I'm not going to do it now. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I. I said. No, uh, yeah, I mean, what we have here is the situation, unclean hearts always offer unclean sacrifices. You know, God, in Isaiah 55, God told the people, 
You know, don't choose your ways, choose my ways. My thoughts are higher than your thoughts. My ways are higher than your ways, he said. Uh, but because they didn't do that, though. They didn't choose God's ways. They chose their own ways in verse 3. And so because they chose their own ways, what will God do? Yeah, He will reject them. He will, verse 4, choose their punishments. You chose this, so I'm going to choose this. You know, it's that, that's how God... It's kind of this back and forth of the word choose there. Um, they called, and in ver, ver, he says, I will bring on them what they dread because I called and no one answered. I mentioned this last time. In Isaiah 64, the people were praying to God, you know, why have we called and you not answered? In Isaiah 65 and verse 12, God tells them, I called and you didn't answer. You got it backwards. Now in Isaiah 66 and verse 4, he says, since... Well, he says, because I called and no one answered, you know, here's a situation now where you're going to basically get what you asked, what, what you described for yourselves. Um, verses 2 and 5 are connected by the phrase, tremble at my word, tremble at his word. What does it mean to tremble at God's word? What does that mean? Yes, Jen. When, when the guards fell down, oh, yeah, well, there's a literal instance. I hadn't thought of that, but there's a literal instance of that happening in John 18 uh, whenever you know, the guards come to arrest Jesus and they say, who do you seek? Jesus of Nazareth, I am he. And all the guards fall down. And I don't think they fell down just because, you know, they got, you know, just because of, you know, some kind of inspiring confidence that Jesus exuded. I think whatever happened there was, you know, supernatural in nature. Jesus is indicating to them that you're not taking me because you take me. You're taking me because I'm letting you is what's going on in John 18. He lets them take him and arrest him. But yeah, they tremble at his word. Now, do they believe his word? No, they don't believe his word, but they still tremble at it. Uh, there's a sense in which all humanity will eventually tremble at the word of God. Whether they believed it or not, they will be forced to believe it at some point. Um, I had, but I don't... Hmm? Yeah. Verse 2, you receive this with him who is a, of a poor and contrite spirit. Yes. And so it's he who handles God's word with reverence. And that, that's probably more, in this context, that's probably more the sense he gets at. I think that you can make a good point about, you know, trembling at God's word from John 18, but in Isaiah 66, what we've got is a situation where, you know, those who are humble and contrite of heart, those are the ones who tremble at my word. Yes, Jen? tremble. Okay, yeah, you got an instance at Mount Sinai. They trembled at God's word at Sinai, didn't they? Now, God said on that occasion, they've spoken well, I wish they would always have this heart in them. I wish they would always be like this. You know, like he knows what's going to happen. <laughs> you know, you're not really going to stay trembling at my word forever. Um, one thing that kind of comes to mind, though, in the context of Isaiah again, remember back in Isaiah 57 in verse 15, the high and exalted one says, who lives forever, whose name is holy, I dwell in a high and holy place and also with the contrite and lowly of spirit in order to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. What you've got here in Isaiah 66 and verse 2, the one who is humble and contrite of spirit and trembles at my word, that's the one I'm going to look at. That's the one God's going to dwell with. The person who recognizes their own sin. You can, you can read the word of God and not tremble at it. You can read the word of God and, and just walk away and it hasn't changed you at all. You just... You know, I mean, there's people in the academic community who do that. They study the Bible as if it were just a piece of literature like Shakespeare or, you know, they would treat it like a piece of Civil War history. It's just to them an academic interest. And, but it doesn't affect their lives. What do we do with that? They're not, they don't tremble at His Word. You know, what happens is when we read the Word of God, we need to allow it to transform us. We need to allow it to convict us of our sins. Yes. 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 And that that that's you know that's that's a that's a huge part of what trembling at His word means is we have to allow the word of God to expose what's wrong with us. You know, if we come to the word of God simply to you know pat ourselves on the back, feel good about ourselves, look at all the stuff I'm doing good, right? That's not how you read the Bible. You read the Bible to learn what you need to change, what you need to change about yourself. And whenever you read, it's like in Ezra 8, they, excuse me, Nehemiah 8, 
Ezra and the people, they read the law. Lo and behold, they come upon something in the law that they're not doing. What's the response? Ignore it and go on. They could have done that. But what did they do? They changed what they were doing. They say, oh, we need to start doing that. That should be our attitude towards the Word of God. When we come across something we're not doing and the text says do it, we need to change. And when we come across something that we are doing and the text says don't do this, we need to change that as well. Otherwise, we don't tremble at His Word. Otherwise, we don't have the right heart or the right spirit. Uh, you know, and yeah, the right respect in that instance. Um, and then other points we can make in verse 5. Uh, there's, a, there's a comment made here. You hear the word of the Lord. You who tremble at His word, that group of people, your brothers who hate you, who exclude you for my name's sake, have said, let the Lord be glorified, that we may see your joy. Well, why would people who hate them say, oh, let the Lord be glorified? Why would they say that? Well, they're hypocrites. Or they're being sarcastic. <laughs> yeah, well, no, I... I always like it when I find sarcasm in the Bible. So this is, you know, one instance of that. Uh, let the Lord be glorified. You see something similar to this in Isaiah 5, actually. Uh, in Isaiah 5 and verse 19, uh, there's this comment. In verses 18 and 19, it says, Woe to those who drag iniquity with the cords of falsehood, and sin is with cart ropes, who say, Let him make speed. Let him make hasten his work, that we may see it. Let the purpose of the Holy One of Israel draw near, and come to pass, that we may know it. You know, well, they're basically saying, yeah, sure, God, we'll believe it when we see it. But, hmm? Mocking. You know, sarcasm. It's the same thing here. Oh, let the Lord be glorified that we may see your joy. But they will be put to shame, the text says in verse 5. They will be put to shame. The temple, the temple that they have trusted in, the temple that they have given so much confidence to, the one that God, they, even though God said, you can't really build a house for me, that temple now becomes a source of judgment. A voice of uproar from the city, a voice from the temple, the voice of the Lord who is rendering recompense to His enemies. In verse 6, uh, you see kind of a similar image in Revelation chapter 11. Whenever the seventh trumpet is sounded, one of the things that happens is all this lightning and flashing and thunder and all these... Uh, terrifying things come out of the temple that's in heaven where the ark is. And, you know, it's a source of judgment for God's people. A terrifying judgment on them. That's a reason to tremble at His word. Because the temple, you're going to put your confidence in the temple? The temple is not your friend if you're acting like this. It's going to destroy you, ultimately. So there, there's, there's an interesting idea in the text as well. Any comments or questions down to verse 6? All right. Uh, Jerusalem is, in verses 7 through 14, Jerusalem is personified as the mother of the people. Uh, they ask a bunch of rhetorical questions in verses 8 and 9. Can a land be born in one day? Can a nation be brought forth all at once? Uh, well, answer to those questions is what? Hmm? Well, the expected answer to the questions is no. I mean... <laughs> Uh, you know, it's like saying, it's kind of an expression like Rome wasn't built in a day. The, but you're right. The only way these things can happen is with divine intervention. Uh, okay, but God goes on. He says, shall I bring to the point of birth and not give delivery? Shall I, give de shall I, shut, shall I who give delivery shut the womb, says your God? Answers to those questions? What? Nope. God's not going to do that. This seems kind of cruel, doesn't it? You know, shut the womb right before birth. She goes into labor and she, the child's not going to come out? What? Well, we've seen that kind of language before in Isaiah. But the point of that is that God's word will not be stopped. God's purpose does not... It can't be thwarted. Whenever God's word is sent out, it does not return to Him empty, as we saw in Isaiah 55 and verses 10 and 11. Just as the rain waters the earth and returns to the clouds... So my word will not return to me without accomplishing its purpose. Okay, so God, you know, it's this kind of this affirmation here. That he's like, I'm not, I'm not going to just promise all these things and then forget about them, God says. But what? Verse 10, be joyful with Jerusalem and rejoice in her. And he begins describing how this Jerusalem will now become a mother, will become a nurse to the people, they will be able to have milk. Uh, God will give them peace. He will comfort them like a mother comforts them. Their heart will be glad. Uh, what's, the, what's, 
the main purpose of all that? When, when is that fulfilled? Jenna. Hey, this could be a Mother's Day sermon. It's not, but this could be the Mother's Day sermon. I've never given the stereotypical Mother's Day sermon uh, four years now. I'll give, maybe I'll give it someday. I don't know, but uh, it's not what I have planned for Sunday, so uh, we'll leave it at that for now. But yeah, there's kind of a, a mother imagery going on here. But when is this idea fulfilled, by the way? Yes. The answer is always Jesus. Uh, yeah, well, yeah, I mean, there's that. Um, in, now, in, in one instance, of course, it's fulfilled now in you know, the church and God's people. Paul in Galatians chapter 4 says that the Jerusalem above is our mother. But of course, there's a sense in which we're kind of still waiting the consummation of that as well. Um, also, you look in verse 13, as one whom his mother comforts, so I will comfort you, and you will be comforted in Jerusalem. Uh, there's a, one of the rare instances in the Bible where God himself is personified in motherly terms. Uh, you don't see that very often. He's usually portrayed as a father. He's usually portrayed as a, um, in, in that concept. But, um, you know, this idea is in here of God comforting his people and caring for them like a mother who writes the child's name on their hand, like a mother who nurses their child. It's a very different way of looking at it. Um, but, and ultimately what we have here is this, it's mourning has been turned into joy. And he makes this distinction here in verse 14. You will see this and your heart will be glad, your bones will flourish, the hand of the Lord will be made known to His servants. There's that idea again of a servant of the Lord being the one who is blessed. But not everybody's a servant of the Lord. There's only there's two groups of people. There's the servants, and who else is there? Hmm? The enemies. Ah, yeah. We saw this contrast in chapter 65. But we're going to see this contrast carried into the end of the book. Because, verses 15 through 17, God is going to come in fire, chariots, a sword. And Anybody who, in verse 17, sanctifies and purifies themselves to go to the gardens, following one in the center. Somebody who eats swine's flesh, detestable things, and mice. Mice were unclean. They're going to come to an end. God makes His hand known to His servants. God is hostile towards His enemies. His judgment is given with fire and a sword against all of this false holiness. All these people who purify themselves and enter the gardens uh, to eat pig's flesh. I don't know if... It, I have no idea if Israel literally did that, if they literally ate pig's flesh, or if they're kosher laws, if they were a little more respectful to kosher laws than that. And I mean, it could be that Isaiah is just like he did in verses 3 and 4, just equating their false worship as if they had done that. It's possible. Um, but in any case, we see that God's blessing is not for everybody. The blessing of the mother of Jerusalem and the gathering of the people is not for all it's only for those who are servants of the Lord. Those who are enemies will not be permitted in. Anything down to verse 17? Alright. Finally, all right, in verses 18 through 24, we have this new passage on the inclusion of the Gentiles. This gathering of the Gentile nations into God's people. Uh, God sets a sign among them and sends survivors from the nations. In verse 19, we have Tarshish, Put, Lud, Meshik, Rosh, Tubal, Javan. Anybody know where all these nations are? <laughs> it's okay. I don't know either. But um, I, I know a couple of them. Tarshish is Spain. Javan is Greece. Uh, but some of these other ones I have no clue on. Um, did you have something, Jen? Yeah. Okay, well... In fact, there's really only a couple places in the Bible where all these nations are mentioned together. One of them is in... You know, Genesis 10, you know, if you read all those, all those exciting begat passages in Genesis chapter 10, these are, this is the table of the nations. These are the Gentile nations that got scattered all over the earth. In Genesis 11, God scattered all the peoples across the face of the earth at the, when the Tower of Babylon was constructed. But now they're not being scattered. They're being gathered together. There's a, a reversal of all of those things here. What do we... Why? Of 
What is God's ultimate goal in Isaiah? Hmm? The universal worship. You know, you have this... I mean, you know, from the Jewish mindset, it's all about, oh, we've got to get our captives back from Babylon. We've got to get our captives back from Assyria. We've got to bring the tribes of Israel all back together again. But God had a bigger plan in mind. Because the scattering that took place among Israel... Well, no, you've got to go all the way back to the beginning. You've got to go all the way back to Genesis 11 where all the nations were scattered across the face of the earth. God has a plan to bring them back together. And when that happens, they will declare my glory among the nations. This is the thing that Isaiah has been getting at really since chapter 2. In chapter 2, he's talked about how the mountain of the Lord of hosts will be exalted as the chief of the mountains and all the nations will flow into it. They're, and they will, you know, they'll beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks and they will never again learn war. There's this gathering together of all the nations in one place. The Gentiles get to see God's glory in verse 18 and they get to declare that glory in verse 19. And in verse 20, it says they will bring back your brethren from all the nations. Yeah, the Israelites will be brought back too. By the Gentiles, there's that interesting twist in the story. No one saw that coming. Just as the sons of Israel bring their grain offering in a clean vessel to the house of the Lord. And in verse 21, here's a real shocker. Some of those Gentiles become priests and Levites. Uh, that's an example of uh, you know, what we might call a covenant coloring there. Uh, these, I mean, you know, there's not literally Levitical priests in the Messianic age. Uh, I mean, for instance, that's not really the point Peter's making in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9. But the, the explicit statement that Gentiles are going to be part of Israel, that's pretty hard to ignore from this side of the cross. You know, I mean, sometimes people will, uh, I, sometimes you'll run into somebody that says, oh, the, the Old Testament never said anything about Gentiles being part of Israel. Did you read it? I mean, what's this passage here in Isaiah 66? This gathering of the nations. Some of them will be priests. Some of them will be Levites. Some of them will be part of this great nation of Israel. Be grafted into the olive tree like Paul describes in Romans 11. And so this passage in some ways has a very personal application for us, you know, who are Gentiles. We've been grafted into the people of God and made into that one new man. So that's a, that's a great thing that's happened. Any comments or questions on that? In verses 22 through 24, we come back to the new heavens and the new earth. Just as the new heavens and the new earth which I make will endure before me, so your offspring and your name will endure. And it will be from new moon to new moon, from Sabbath to Sabbath, all mankind will come and bow down before me. So they all get to worship God. Universal worship. You know, you see this kind of stuff in Isaiah 45. Every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Zechariah 14 talks about the gathering of the nations at Jerusalem to celebrate the Feast of Booths. But does everybody get to participate in the worship? No. What? What happened? Who misses out on it? Huh? The hypocrites! And you get this kind of picture. They're gathered together in this new temple for worship. And as they come out of the temple, they turn around and they look and they see the corpses of the men who've transgressed against me. This is the note that Isaiah chooses to end his book on. Uh, you know, they might, you might get a visual, a word picture in your head of this temple in Jerusalem. They look out and they see the, the burning waste valley besides Jerusalem. Um, there's some dispute about whether Gehenna, uh, Gehenna was actually a garbage dump by Jerusalem where people would burn their garbage, but uh, that's one theory that's out there. And if that's true, it definitely provides an interesting image here. Uh, and it becomes the basis for the New Testament descriptions of hell. And that comment in Isaiah 66, 24, their worm will not die and their fire will not be quenched. Where do we read that else in the Bible? Who else says that in Scripture? Jesus says that quite a bit. Uh, he talks about Mark 9, for instance. That's his, one of his word pictures of choice to describe hell. And here's the real kicker. In verse 22, New heavens and the new earth will endure before me. And your offspring and your name will endure. It's going to last. But something else is going to last too. Their worm will not die. Their fire will not be quenched. Just as the new heavens and the new earth endure, so the punishment of the enemies is enduring, unending. 
No peace for the wicked. Isaiah said that twice in Isaiah 48, 22 and Isaiah 57, 21. The vengeance, the day of vengeance declared in Isaiah 63 is now complete. And we may think that's a harsh way to end the book of Isaiah, but it is logically demanded by the rest of the vision. Because throughout these chapters, Isaiah has been stressing two things. There is going to be a new creation. And in that new creation, we're going to have a permanent reversal of everything that's wrong. We're going to see the glory of God. We're going to be gathered together into one people. We're going to have a universal worship together. But number two, there are going to be winners and losers. There are going to be people who transgress against God and will not turn to Him. And there are going to be people that choose God. There's going to be people that serve God. And there's going to be those who are enemies. And those terms are as God defines them. Subsequently, if the servants get to partake of the new creation and enjoy the eternal permanent bliss, there must be, by necessity, an equal and opposite reaction for the enemies. Eternal and permanent suffering. There are going to be winners and losers. But the good news is that it's not like God just randomly picked out of a hat. Okay, these people get to go to heaven. These people get to go to hell. There's nothing they can do about it. Is characterized precisely by the choice that Isaiah has always given. If you return and repent, you shall eat the best of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you will be eaten by the sword. So, a lot more we could say. It reminds us the importance of giving God our true worship. Does any anything that um, anybody else have anything to add here at the end? That's the end of Isaiah. I've enjoyed studying it and I hope that y'all have enjoyed it and it's been edifying or encouraging to you as well. Uh, next week, next week I want to look at the, begin looking at the book of Ephesians. We'll have a few weeks to study that. Uh, I would recommend reading the book of Ephesians uh, before next time. You can and uh, we'll pick up there.